the minimax search and the structure of cognition, exclamation point. So it all started at my old day job where some of my coworkers had an office chess game going. And I really wanted to participate and be part of the team, but I didn't want to invest the effort in actually learning how to play chess well. So I did what any programmer would do, and I wrote a chess engine to do it for me. Um, actually, I felt like writing a chess engine was too much of a cliche, so I decided that my program was an AI for a game that happens to be exactly like chess, except everything has different names. <laughs> anyway, my program wasn't, wasn't actually terribly good, but I learned a lot about how to think for the same reason that building a submarine in your garage would be a great way to learn how to swim. <laughs> uh, so consider a two-player two -player board game like chess, or indeed any two-player zero-sum perfect information game. And suppose we know how to calculate how good a particular board position is for a player. In chess, the way we do this is by assigning a point value to each type of piece and totaling up the remaining point values for each piece for each player. Uh, now, because only one player can win the game, what's good for one player is equally bad for the other player. And so if we add up the piece values for one player and subtract for the, from the other, we get a score for the board position that the first player is trying to maximize and the second player is trying to minimize. Um, so consider a player pondering her move. Uh, for every possible legal move she could make, she knows what the board position will look like after that move and can calculate the value of that position. So you might think she should choose the move that results in the best value. Um, for example, if you can capture the opponent's queen, you know, that would make the subsequent board position be worth nine more points. Now, the problem with that is it's short-sighted. If capturing the opponent's queen would just result in the, op first, the opponent capturing the first player's queen back, then what looked like a nine-point game after one turn ends up being a wash after both players have taken their turn. So to take this into account, the first player should consider not just the immediate outcome of her move, but what the other player is likely to do after that. And the way you compute that is by asking, well, what would I do if I were in that position except trying to minimize the score in, rather than maximizing it? And so on recursively. So instead of just choosing the move with the best immediate consequences, we want to look at the entire game tree of my best move, given her best move, given my best move, given all the way down to some given depth, which you know specify in advance, some given depth at which we give up, take the point count at face value, and then sort of propagate that information back up the call stack. So that's how you play chess. Um, I wanted to tell you about two sort of more philosophical flavored insights I learned from this endeavor. Um, first, on the emergence of instrumental goals. Uh, some decision theorists like to distinguish between terminal goals and instrumental goals. Terminal goals are things that you want to achieve for your own sake, like love, or happiness, winning a chess game, <laughs> whereas <laughs> instrumental goals are things that you want to achieve not for their own sake, but because they lead to terminal goals. You know, washing your hair, getting enough sleep, capturing one of your opponent's pawns. So chess enthusiasts have names for uh, specific, specific board situations that have special significance because they happen to be advantageous for one of the players. For example, um, when a piece is in a, in a position to you know, attack more than one of, of the opposing, opposing pieces, we call that a fork. Um, or when one piece like, moves out of the way to reveal an attack by another that's hiding behind it, we call that a discovered attack. Um, and so when observing the chess engine's behavior, it's really tempting like, and like wondering, why did it do that? It's really tempting to interpret it in psychological terms and say, oh, well, it's trying to set up that fork. It's trying to set up a discover attack. It wants to do these things. But it can't be, literally can't be, because those concepts aren't represented anywhere in the algorithm. <laughs> the code is just brute forcing the game tree to find sequences of moves that result in capturing material. Now, humans don't have the computational power to do this efficiently. So instead, we total, tend to notice features of board situations that lead to capturing material and then give them special names and treat them as instrumental goals to be sought out. As indeed, our piece counting score in our chess engine is actually just an instrumental goal that happens to be, usually be useful towards the terminal goal of checkmate. Similarly, if you could do a god's eye view brute force search of the optimal paths through a human life, you know many such paths as a statistical regularity would happen to involve giving, getting, getting enough sleep. And so if you, have, you know, if you have limited computational power, you might want to just treat that as you know, an instrumental goal tactically to reason about directly. <laughs> Second insight about counterfactual reasoning. So the, this, the, the adversarial recursive nature of you know, my best move, given her best move, given my best move, leads to some behavior that looks really strange 
compared to how you would reason about optimizing an environment that isn't intelligently imposing your goals. So if you're not facing an intelligent opponent, you just want to make plans to directly accomplish whatever you're trying to accomplish. And in particular, you wouldn't bother trying things that you can predict won't happen. You wouldn't bother packing your suitcase if you didn't intend to go anywhere. On the other hand, maybe you would bother loading a gun even if you didn't intend to fire it. Because when facing an intelligent opponent, you need to take into account how your choices affect your opponent's choices. And so this leads our algorithm to set up attacks that it predicts won't be realized because the credible threat constrains the opposing player's choices. So in a game with my coworkers, uh, this position came up um, as part of the engine's planning shortly after moving the black bishop to f5, where there's this algebraic notation where the columns are lettered a through h, and the rows are 1 through 8. I mean, they call them ranks and files, but you know, everything has different names. <sighs> um, so here, the engine's predicted move for black is knight to g3. And when I saw that, like, at first glance, this looked crazy to me, because like, why would you move the knight there, where it could just immediately get eaten by those pawns? And of course, what's actually happening is that moving the knight reveals a discovered attack of the, you know, uh, of the bishop against the white queen on c3. Saving the queen is more important to white than capturing the black knight. So that allows black to use her next turn to capture the white rook on h1. But this is pretty weird, right? The algorithm has gone to all this trouble to set up a discovered attack on the white queen in order to, to capture the white rook, not the queen. And this kind of behavior has analogs in real life whenever you have situations where different agents, different systems have conflicting goals and can respond to each other's behavior. So for example, if people can predict that if they were to commit crimes, then they would be punished, that incentivizes them to obey the law in the first place because the threat of punishment is shaping the population's behavior even if no one is actually going to be punished for that very reason. Uh, there's an old joke about a UC Santa Cruz student sprinkling powder outside her dorm who, when questioned, responds, oh, this? It's elephant repellent. The questioner replies, but there aren't any elephants in Santa Cruz. The student counter replies, well, that's how you know it's working. <laughs> but you see, sometimes that actually is the explanation. Thank you. <laughs>